Good morning. Well, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what I've learned over the last 30 years defeating physical security devices, systems, and programs. And as an old geezer, I'm required by union rules to have to give you advice whether you want any or not. So I'm going to offer some advice in addition to people and organizations who want to have better security and also advice to uh, vulnerability assessors and hackers, uh, including uh, hobbyist hackers. So I'm kind of uh, semi-retired, but I, I do have this little company called Right Brain Security. We do some consulting and a little bit of teaching. And uh, as I talk about, I'm doing a little bit of hobbyist hacking myself. So I spent 30 years head of the vulnerability assessment team at Los Alamos National Laboratory and also Argonne National Laboratory. And we did the work for everybody except the laboratories. So as I'll talk about, you never want to be a vulnerability assessor doing vulnerability assessments for your employer. It's too much of a career risk. But we did it for everybody else. So we did it for the federal government, various agencies, did it for the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, did it for private companies and also for uh, nonprofits. So some of the stuff I've worked on, I've done vulnerability assessments in these areas. Actually, uh, 20 years ago, we were the first to demonstrate that GPS is really easy to spoof, uh, not just jam. Wasn't much interest in it at the time, but in the last seven years or so, there's been a great deal of interest. And if you're not familiar with the terminology, a trap is a covert seal. And then uh, uh, in addition to finding vulnerabilities and recommending countermeasures, uh, we developed a lot of novel types of security devices in these areas. Uh, certainly being a vulnerability assessor is kind of a schizophrenic job. We'd find some elegant attack and then we'd be all happy. But then we'd think, wait a minute, the bad guys can exploit this. Then we were sad. But then we think, wow, well, we found the vulnerability. That means we can fix it. So now we're happy. But wait a minute, no one will probably pay any attention. And they won't fix the problem. So now we're sad again. So it's a real roller coaster of emotions. In terms of devices, I'm a big fan of anti-evidence approaches. So instead of having, for example, on a tamper-indicating seal, instead of having to have evidence that there's been unauthorized access, you can instead have uh, evidence that there hasn't been, and that gets erased when tampering occurs. Now, the bad guys don't gain anything by counterfeiting the hardware or repurposing the existing seal. And similarly, with real-time monitoring, like a burglar alarm, uh, you don't send an alarm, which is easily blocked. Uh, every once in a while, you send some secret bits that are, if you want, buried in communications channels. And if that ceases to come, then you know that there's, there's been a problem. Other stuff I've worked on, well, security course isn't really about technology. Technology is just a tool. It's really about these things. It's really about people. Um, so I've done a lot of thinking about these kinds of issues, which really ultimately determine uh, how effective security is going to be. So I've kind of encapsulated uh, over the last 30 years all the stuff I've learned, in a, and I think I'm up to 211 security maxims. So these are generalized observations about security. Uh, some of them are a little tongue-in-cheek. Um, a lot of them are pretty cynical. That does not make them untrue. Uh, if you've seen as much bad security of I, as I've seen, you would be cynical. Uh, but also, I think being cynical is very helpful uh, for a vulnerability assessor or a hacker uh, because it uh, makes you see through the hype and the uh, hidden assumptions that so often plague security. So here's just two examples of security maxims, the you must be high maxim one and the you must be high maxim two. That basically any security product that is labeled high security isn't. And high security is a context and application dependent value judgment. It's not a product attribute. So I have long maintained that the amount of careful, critical, and creative thought that's gone into the security of soda vending machines greatly exceeds that that's gone into um, nu nuclear safeguards. 
and actually there's a reason for that. Um, whenever we have really, really important security, uh, basically what happens is the security gets taken over by bureaucrats and committees and senior managers and other assholes like that. And um, basically there's a certain mental paralysis and really an unwillingness to question or experiment because the stakes are so high. One of the problems with really serious security is that it often involves layered security. So in physical security, we like to have nested levels of security. And uh, while I'm not saying don't do this, it uh, often leads to very bad thinking. It's kind of a cop-out. It gives an excuse not to think carefully about security. So the weight layered security maxim basically says the complex layered security will fail stupidly. Lots and lots of examples, one I like, 2012, an 82-year-old nun, a gardener, and a house painter break into the U.S. government's Y-12 nuclear complex, essentially Fort Knox for uranium. Uh, they, what they wanted to do is just cut the initial chain link fence, then they'd come and get arrested and make a big statement about the importance of peace and going non-nuclear. So they cut the, the fence and nothing happened. So then they just kept going through multiple layers of security. Uh, it turned out the, the video cameras had not been working for several months. Uh, they did trip an alarm, but uh, the day before there had been maintenance and construction at the facility, so the security guards thought that's what was going on. So the poor, these three poor people were kind of bewildered. They didn't know what to do, so they just kept going. Eventually they got to the building, which housed the nuclear material. So they were 20 feet away from serious nuclear material. There's a wall there. And so they don't know what to do because nothing's happening, so they spray paint some peace slogans on the building. And something to do with pounding your, your swords into plowshares, they take a hammer and start pounding away on the wall. And the security guards hear this, but again, it must be the construction maintenance people. <laughs> so some hours go by, and eventually a guard shows up. Now there's a problem. There's nothing in the manual that says what, how you deal with 82-year-old nuns breaking into Y-12. So he doesn't know what to do. So more time goes by. Well, eventually they do arrest them. They, they haul them off. Of course, they're going to scapegoat that one guy, the one guard who actually did something. They, of course, fire. They don't fire anybody else. They replace the management company that runs the security. But the new management company just hires all the old people back. So you know, nothing, nothing really changes. White House 2014, man, people have been jumping the White House fence for 200 years. But in 2014, a man jumps the White House fence. He goes through the unlocked back door of the White House. I guess it's a safe neighborhood, so they don't have to lock the back door. And he's finally tackled inside the White House by an off-duty Secret Service agent. And then in 2017, having learned exactly nothing, another man jumps the fence and he wanders the grounds for 17 minutes. So this is layered security. It usually fails stupidly. And a related maxim is the depth, what depth maxim. So whenever we do new work, I ask the the client or the sponsor, what's your security strategy? If the first word out of their mouth is layered security, I know they're going to be a basket case. But if they actually have a strategy, and then they say, oh yeah, and we use layered security, then we'll find vulnerabilities, but they won't be idiotic ones. So I've done a lot of work on election security, the overall process. Um, but we also uh, attacked electronic voting machines. But we did, we didn't do the cyber because lots of other people do the cyber. We attack them uh, electronically, which is really, really easy. You do need physical access, but many, many people, often with no background checks, have access to these voting machines. So it's pretty easy. You need you know, maybe a minute of access time. And then there's a little remote control unit here where you can turn the cheating on and off. Uh, in principle, if these voting machines are actually tested, that would be an issue. But because they never really test them the right way to find these kinds of attacks. It, it's really just kind of overkill. So here's something I did as a hobbyist hacker, uh, now that I'm kind of semi-retired. So I did this um, for about 200 bucks in my basement, kind of an example of what hobbyists can do. So around the world, particularly in developing countries, in order to prevent people from double voting, they stain your finger. It can be your thumb, your finger, often it's uh, they draw a line across the nail, through the cuticle, and then onto the skin. And that stain is supposedly indelible. 
So that's going to, if you try to vote again, they'll see the stain and they won't let you vote. So that's the theory anyway. So how does this work? Well, it's usually based on silver nitrate solutions. Uh, this approach is used in 38 countries. Uh, over 4 billion people have had this silver nitrate applied to them since 1962, some more than 20 times. It's also used for other applications and elections. Uh, so we're exposing to 4 billion people and there's no previous published analysis of the security or the safety. You can see here this uh, voters dipping their finger into the, the uh, pot of uh, silver nitrate with a sort of a red dye. You can see the big mess on the table. Stuff's really messy. Stains everything. All right, so here's uh, what I did. I've got uh, laid out two silver nitrate lines, like is often done. This has kind of a green-blue dye, so you can see it, because the silver nitrate solutions are very transparent. The other line you can't see because it's so transparent. But uh, after um, two hours in room illumination, the stain turns this kind of blackish color. And then after six hours in the sun, it turns really black. So that's basically the stain that's being used to mark you as having voted. Safety issues, we don't know very much about the toxicology of silver nitrate solutions. It's probably not a carcinogen, but boy, having exposed 4 billion people, it'd sure be nice to know. The toxicity may be problematic if you look at the material safety data sheet for silver nitrate solutions. It talks about it as, you know, being fairly nasty stuff. And there certainly um, have been bad skin burns on election officials who get exposed to this stuff. So how does this work? What's the chemistry? Well, you got silver nitrate, which is highly water soluble. Uh, and then what it does is it reacts to the salt in your hand from the sweat and skin oils. The silver nitrate then converts over to silver chloride, which is not water soluble, and sodium nitrate. Next step is that the sodium chloride, uh, silver chloride reacts with ultraviolet light, a little bit with blue light, and turns into silver. That's actually the stain. And chlorine gas comes off. So this is coming off your finger. And then the silver, in turn, can tarnish, uh, can darken and change colors due to sulfur or the organic compounds on your fingers. So that's kind of the three-step process. So how do you attack this? Well, lots of different attacks that I demonstrated. Before, so let's say you want to uh, vote illegally multiple times. Before each vote, you're going to wash your hands with soap and water to remove the salt and the organics. That'll help slow down the reaction. After the staining, what you want to do is avoid getting light on your finger. So you can just put your finger into a fist uh, or you can put on gloves or whatever because if it doesn't get exposed to ultraviolet light, it's not going to convert over to the silver stain. And then all you got to do is, as soon as voting, as soon as you're through voting, go rinse it off. And the silver nitrate, so water soluble, will all come off. So you can do that if you want with a little aluminum foil cot like this on the finger, or you can just wear gloves, or you can just keep your hand in a fist. Alternately, you can do a kind of a backdoor attack where you apply a, before you vote, you apply a protective layer. You can use egg white. Um, I found what worked really well is Revlon matte nail top coat. I learned more about cosmology than I ever think I would ever need to know. This, for a time, was really popular all over the world, including in developing countries. For some reason, it was very cool for women not to have shiny nails, but you put this top coat on after the nail polish, and it had this matte finish. And that actually protects, then, from the silver nitrate getting onto the skin. And when you're done voting, you just wash it off with nail polish remover, either the egg white uh, or the matte top coat. Now, the egg white's not so wettable, so it looks a little funny, it behaves a little funny, but you can do things to make it more wettable. So here we have example. This is uh, my finger coated with the Revlon matte top coat. You can see the finger looks pretty normal. There's the stain. And uh, after the fingernail polish remover, then the finger's exposed to sunlight for quite a few hours. There's no, no staining there. So that works pretty well. Uh, although it's a bit of an overkill, you can do the other steps, just protect the finger from light. So this looks kind of gruesome, but it's just me with two lines of silver nitrate. You can get a sense of the kind of the purplish, greenish, yellow shades that the silver tarnishes at due to the sulfur and organics. So if you do somehow mess up, you can remove the stain 
with a freshly prepared uh, mixture of um, copper sulfate and sodium thiosulfate. These are, these are safe, cheap chemicals are available even in developing countries. It does a nice job of taking the stain off the, the finger on the skin, as you can see on the right. Uh, and pretty good on the cuticle, but it doesn't take the nail off, the stain off the nail very well. But it turns out you can, uh, a good nail technician can grind down the nail or you can do it yourself and that'll take the stain off. You can only do that on the nail, however, two or three times before the nail thins out too much. So that limits how many illegal double votings you can do. Uh, results, well, the cost per illegal duplicate vote in quantity is about two US cents to 40 cents, depending on the attack. Probably a lot cheaper in developing countries. Turnaround time is seven to 40 minutes, depending on the attack. So you can vote potentially 100 times a day, and in many countries, the elections run for four days. So one person could vote many, many times. So what are the countermeasures? Well, it's really quite a range of things. The first thing you might think of is why not just not use the stain, right? Well, if you think about India, they just finished with a federal election. 800 million people voted at almost 1 million different polling stations. So if, say, you wanted to buy biometrics or something, it would be enormous expense. You'd have to train all these people probably not practical. So if you're going to use the voter's ink, what are the countermeasures? Well, one thing you can do is uh, protect the, the ink from tampering. Some evidence that a lot of election jurisdictions don't really do that. You can inspect voters' hands very, very carefully looking for this top coat. Um, you can kind of buff the fingers down to make sure to rub off any of that top coat. You can dip their fingers in a weak salt solution try to increase the salt content on the skin. Uh, you definitely, as a countermeasure, want to apply the stain before they vote. In India and most countries, it's done after. Now, if you do it before, that makes a gigantic mess in the polling place. You get stains everywhere. You get it on the voting booths. You get it on the election officials. But it allows the most time for the salt to react and the, and the ultraviolet light to react. You also want to watch out for people. Say maybe they have a cup of tea cup of coffee, they just get it stained and they're dipping their finger in to try to wash off the silver nitrate, or they're making a fist or they're putting on gloves. These are typically in warm climates. Um, or you just tell the public, you know, one countermeasure, tell the public, watch out for citizens that seem to be protecting a finger from visible light. So anyway, I've got this, uh, this study. It seems to be the first one at least publicly available. It's got the vulnerabilities, but it's got some fairly simple countermeasures. So. I decided to see if anybody was interested. So I sent out maybe, I contacted maybe six dozen people, newspapers that had run articles all over the world on indelible voter zinc, the reporters who wrote those articles. Uh, I contacted a lot of um, election officials, these people that go globally to developing countries and help observe the voting process. You know, zero interest. So even though there were fairly simple countermeasures one could implement. And this is pretty typical, right? When you find vulnerabilities, there's usually not much interest, even when there are practical, simple countermeasures. So I'll talk a little bit about some other kinds of things. I've done a lot of work with product anti-counterfeiting tags. So this is something to deal with product authenticity. But it's really an unsolved problem. Um, most anti-counterfeiting tags are easy to defeat. Low-tech methods, uh, embossed holograms you can duplicate in your kitchen. One of the best ways, if it's a more sophisticated hologram and it's got layers in it, uh, one of the easiest ways to fool consumers is you just go buy some holographic wrapping paper. It's kind of silvery and it's got that rainbowy sheen. And then you print the globe or the eagle or the dove or whatever image is supposed to be on the, the hologram. And 95% of consumers will just look at it and they'll see the shiny rainbow and they'll go, okay. Some of them might even look at the imprinted pattern. You know, so that's really cheap, a cheap, man, cheap man's way of uh, making fake holograms. Um, typically, uh, some of the high-tech tags where you need a reader, uh, the reader itself is not designed with any real security. It's not typically protected very well, so you can attack the reader as well. Uh, and also with high-tech uh, tags, if they use things like DNA, you can do a dilution attack where you just the bad guys just take, dilute down some of this material put it on their counterfeit products. And because the reader in the real world has to have this huge dynamic range because the signal strength varies enormously, you can make between 10 and 100 copies uh, if you buy one authentic product, even on the high-tech tags. So it's really kind of a, uh, an issue. 
done lots of work with seals. Of course, a lock uh, is not a seal. A lock is meant to delay or prevent entry. A seal doesn't do that, but it leaves behind evidence. So these are tamper indicating seals. A barrier seal is part lock, part seal. I don't really like them. They're a compromise. You don't get the best lock. You don't get the best seal. People are endlessly confused when they look at the, the object about whether it's, they're looking at it as a lock or a seal. Fortunately, in the business, they often call these high security seals if they're barrier seals, which is terrible terminology. Uh, there are seals that can be torn open with five pounds of force that are very good seals if used properly. So there's no reason that tamper detection can't be considered a security application. Uh, traps are covert seals, which is very interesting. Uh, flag seals, there's no malicious adversary. You're just marking, say, a container. It's already been processed. Don't reopen it. And tamper evident packaging for like products. Again, largely an unsolved problem. Lots of examples of terrible seal use. Uh, pressure sensitive adhesive label seals, classic for really, really bad seal practice. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So here's forensics evidence. So whether someone's going to get 20 life uh, in, in the trial depends on the evidence being protected by a grocery bag in many major police departments, at least in the United States. Yeah, there's a seal, but no serial number, and just some scribbled initials that no one really checks. And of course, it would be absolutely impossible to open the bottom of the grocery bag, because these are really high-tech grocery bags. They can't even bother to print their own unique grocery bag, right? I mean, just make it a little easier, a little harder for the bad guys. Similarly, they're not protecting the seams here. Again, no serial number. The evidence bags are a little bit better, not a lot. Some of them can detect certain solvents and thermal attacks, but it's still not very good protection. As hobbyist hackers, these are fun to go after because they're cheap. You can get a whole bunch of them and play around. And they're really interesting. Voting machines, this one's plastered with all kinds of pressure sensitive adhesive seals. There's no way in the world anybody had enough time to properly inspect all those seals. There's more on the inside. Anytime you see something like this, it just tells you that the container's not been designed for tamper detection. Here's an election seal, state of Michigan, no serial number. And here's some other bad examples. People love to take pressure sensitive pieces of seals and stick them on polyethylene containers. Polyethylene is one of the slipperiest plastics. So this is part of a urine test kit to determine if you're going to fire or hire somebody because they're using illegal drugs. And the adhesive label seal comes off on its own because it doesn't stick to the polyethylene. Similar problem here, but also they've got tamper resistant. Seals don't resist tampering. They indicate it. Uh, but it's also being applied to polyethylene, and the only indication there is a seal in use is on the seal itself. So when that's removed, there's nothing. So here's uh, these high-tech void seals. Sometimes they say opened. Sometimes they say tamper. Sometimes they say void. You know, quite obviously, it'd be absolutely impossible for the bad guys to get a solvent and clean up that substrate and then to get paint and repair the missing void on the seal because, you know, that would require access to, like, a hardware store. And, you know, what are the odds bad guys could, could do that? Here we have a seal uh, on a gas pump. People love to put adhesive label seals outdoors. Don't know what they're thinking. So this has presumably not been attacked, but you can see the opened sign all over the place. Here's one where the seal and the serial number have been separated. This seal came off on its own from a uh, gas pump. So here we have um, some of the better security for security products. So this is a dual Doppler microwave, passive infrared motion detector used by governments, used by private companies, used in homes. And what they've done is to try to protect it from tampering. They've got an adhesive label seal, no serial number. But of course, if you turn the box over, you could just come on from the inside uh, with no seal. And this is better security than many security manufacturers and vendors provide for their products. There's really not very good supply chain security for a lot of security products. And typically, 20 seconds of access time is all one needs with a lot of practice uh, to completely own these things. Uh, then there's this kind of problem. So are we all set for sound? All right, let's give it a try. Not, not yet. 
getting much sound. Let's see here. I'm at max, so I should be getting some. All right. Well, we'll um, I'll just explain a little bit what, what's here. Um, this is a problem psychologists call perceptual blindness or change blindness. People are just horrible, horrible observers, which is bad enough, but they don't understand how bad they are. So this is a little um, video that shows that you probably aren't very good at observing changes. So I'll move on from this. And maybe if we can figure it out, we can play it later. It's pretty fun. All right. So... Let me offer some advice for security manufacturers, vendors, and security managers. Uh, lots and lots of things I could potentially say from all the, the bad practices and the good practices that I've seen. Well, first of all, it's real important to be clear these are not vulnerabilities. So threats are not vulnerabilities. Threats are who might attack, when, where, how, why. Your assets to protect are not vulnerabilities. Uh, a few years ago, a industry in the United States, I won't say which one, uh, all the security managers got together and wrote a big, thick report on the security challenges in our industry. And the report opened up by saying, in our industry, we have a lot of vulnerabilities, and here they are, and it listed all the assets they were trying to protect. Okay. The problem is if they hijack the, the term vulnerability, and there aren't a lot of good replacement words, then they can't really think about uh, or design better approaches to security. So assets are not vulnerabilities. And security or infrastructure features are not vulnerabilities. It's common in physical security to say, well, we have this fence and there's a gate uh, in the fence, and that's a vulnerability. No, it's not. It's a feature. Perhaps combined with some security attack scenarios, it might become a vulnerability, but it's not in and of itself. Attacks are not vulnerabilities. Risks are not vulnerabilities. A risk assessment is not a vulnerability assessment. A vulnerability assessment is part of a risk assessment. Ordinarily, semantics don't matter that much, but if it controls how we think about things, it really becomes a problem. And similarly, these are not vulnerability assessments. Okay? These are something else. Some of these things are definitely worth doing, but they're not particularly good at finding new vulnerabilities because they're not fundamentally focused on finding new vulnerabilities. So a little bit about red, red teaming. In the old days, back during the good old Cold War, when everything was crystal clear and we knew who's the good guys and who the bad guys were, uh, red teaming referred to the people pretending to be Russians. They were, they were Reds, also called Ivans. And red teaming was vulnerability assessments. But in recent years, this term's gotten hijacked. And a lot of people now, by red teaming, they mean it's a pass-fail kind of narrow test of security using one type of attack scenario. Uh, oftentimes, the whole thing is rather rigged. So it's, you know, it's not that red teaming is necessarily a bad thing to be doing, but it's just different from a vulnerability assessment. And sometimes, particularly in the nuclear realm, uh, people like fault or event trees, but that's from safety. That's not a security approach. And the nuclear people love design basis threat, which is uh, definitely not a vulnerability assessment. OK, so there's lots of big problems in security. I'm just going to rattle through some of them. Uh, certainly not enough vulnerability assessments in my view. Of course, I have a conflict of interest here. I do vulnerability assessments, so of course I want more of them. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Um, they need to be done early, iteratively, and often. Thinking that vulnerabilities are bad news, they're good news. Vulnerabilities are always present in very large numbers. When we find one, we can do something about it. Fallacy of precision. This is thinking that because we can assign numbers to something, we really understand it. Fear of NORC. Well, um, NORC is basically the non-objective, the non-reproducible, the non-quantitative. And the thing is, real risk management, ultimately, the best risk management is subjective. There are quantitative, rigorous things you can do, but inherently they're not going to give you the best security. Particularly in physical security, arrogance, overconfidence, cognitive dissonance is a big problem. 
So cognitive dissonance is the mental tension between what we want to be true, we want to have good security, what's likely to be true, there are probably going to be problems. It's not a problem in and of itself, it's how we handle it. If it isn't handled carefully, it can lead to self-justification, which is self-serving rationalization, excuse making, it can lead to stagnation, it can lead to confirmation bias or motivated reasoning, which is unduly dismissing ideas, arguments, evidence, or data that might call into question our current viewpoints, strong hopes, or past decisions. Lack of imagination, a huge problem. Lack of envisioning failure. You can't prevent failure if you don't envision it. Lack of preparation for when security invariably fails. And a big problem, particularly in physical security, is scapegoating, like at Y12. Shooting the messenger is a vulnerability assessor. I know all about that. Low transparency. Uh, security by obscurity doesn't work. People and organizations cannot keep long-term secrets. Somewhat counterintuitively, security is usually better when it's transparent. Um, transparency allows for things like review and criticism, accountability, buy-in, and continuous improvement. Now, you need some short-term secrets, like current computer password, when is a nuclear material going to ship, but by and large, trying to keep long-term secrets is a big mistake. Big problem in physical security is not enough what-if exercises. What if this happens? What if the 82-year-old nun shows up? Uh, there's often no checking of security devices for alien parts or tampering, which makes the hacker's job real easy. Many people using security devices have no idea what the insides look like. Poor public relations after hacks or serious attacks. Other kinds of problems. Binary thinking. So people talk often about gaps in security. That's terrible terminology. Uh, so security is a continuum. It's not a question of secure, not secure. Security theater, fake security for show. Security theater is very hard to resist because it gives you lots of warm and fuzzy feelings. Real security makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, security theater is often cheaper, often easier than real security. Control often gets confused with security. Compliance often gets confused with security. As a general rule, I think about 30% of all security rules, regulations, and standards actually make security worse because they don't consider local conditions and because they were developed by somebody high up who doesn't really know what they're doing. Poor chain of custody and supply chain for security products, big problem. But here's the biggest thing, particularly in physical security, is customers aren't demanding good security. They're just not. So why should manufacturers put it in? It costs extra, it's really hard. Why be in a, an economic disadvantage to your competitors if no one really is asking for good security? There's little legal consequences for selling junk in the security business, starting a change, but. Big mistake, not to proactively mitigate disgruntled employees, narcissists, and Cassandras. Cassandras are people like hackers that predict vulnerabilities, but then when nobody takes them seriously, the Cassandra goes out and does an attack to demonstrate that they were right all along. So this actually happened, uh, you know, classic examples in 2001 where five people in the U.S. died from an uh, anthrax attack, believed to be done by a Cassandra. There are simple countermeasures to all these things, disgruntled employees, narcissists, and Cassandras. Lots of uh, modern psychological research really isn't exploited. So, for example, psychologists know that you should have employees sign at the top of a form, not at the bottom, but that they'll be honest. So that's a better approach. Um, there are <laughs> lots of research that shows if you put up a poster of angry eyes in, in sensitive areas, people will behave themselves better. If you want more money contributed to the coffee fund, put up a poster of angry eyes. It's all subconscious. People might not even recognize the poster, but they feel they're being watched. It's a very, very effective technique. Uh, there's lots of research on how to deal with the sunk cost bias, big problem in security. Countermeasures to groupthink, to cognitive dissonance, to perceptual blindness. Lots of rigorous research on creativity, which is very important for security managers and for vulnerability assessors. Big mistake, not to realize engineers don't get security. Engineers are great. They do wonderful things. They're really smart. It's a completely different mindset. If the only people looking at your security are engineers, you're in big trouble. But you better have some engineers looking at it too. 
Inventory functions get confused all the time with security. GPS was an inventory function, inventory technology. Never meant to do security, started to get used that way. All inventory systems eventually get thought of as security systems. Big mistake. And not thinking and talking a lot about the bad guys. So I know a number of people in the pharmaceutical industry and they are told you may not ever send an email internally talking about tampering or counterfeiting because that increases our legal liability. Well now if they can't talk about it, how are they gonna plan for it? How are they gonna provide countermeasures? So this is uh, something to keep in mind if you're doing security. If you're happy with your security, so are the bad guys and the pain in the ass maxim, you can be comfortable or you can have good security, pick one, because you can't have both. So security is not about being com comfortable, it's about being really, really uncomfortable. That's why sec security theater is so seductive. It's got lots of warm and fuzzy feelings associated with it. But that right there tells you it's bad. All right, so let me um, talk a little bit about um, some advice for ethical hackers and vulnerability assessors. Uh, first of all, you know, please be legal, be ethical, be responsible. Don't be a Cassandra. Don't do extortion. Um, don't gloat. Physical security in particular is really, really hard. I think it's much harder than cyber, and cyber is plenty hard. Uh, yes, there are uh, lots of arrogant assholes in physical security, but there are also a lot of people trying really hard uh, to the best of their ability to have physical security. So, you know, don't do cheap shots uh, if you found a vulnerability. Um, certainly, don't just find vulnerabilities, suggest countermeasures. Even if your countermeasure isn't the ultimate one, it doesn't matter. It gets people thinking about potential countermeasures. Uh, if you're an uh, ethical hacker and you found a problem, don't be in a big rush. Don't expect the government agency or the company to respond positively initially. Uh, their immediate response from the public relations people, the lawyers, the top executives is it would be to deny and attack you. Give them a chance to um, make the changes. Remember that attacks using limited skill and expertise and money carry much more bang for the buck. They impress people more than some kind of high tech attack. If you need a nuclear accelerator to do the attack, you're not gonna impress that many people with it. Uh, keep in mind low tech beats high tech every time pretty much. You can do high tech attacks, but why? Um, and what I found is you don't really have to substantially understand the system that you're trying to defeat, uh, just certain aspects of it. Keep in mind the best ideas for vulnerabilities and attacks come early and they come late. So you want to plan for that kind of thing. And for um, ethical hackers, I'd really recommend getting umbrella liability insurance. Not as big a deal in Australia as it is in the US. Or start up a little company or a nonprofit to protect yourself from liability issues. Not currently a huge problem, but it's kind of headed that way, at least in the US. And I might suggest you kind of rethink uh, hacker names. Um, really, when it comes to physical security, uh, ethical hackers have to be the adults in the room. And if your hacker name makes people think that you're a, a pirate or a terrorist uh, or a professional wrestler or a, a comic book character, it's, it's really not helping the situation. If you must have a pseudonym, try something innocent sounding, Mary Smith or something like that. It's just a question of you know how much impact you're gonna have. Okay, so talking about the role of ethical hackers and vulnerability assessors. One problem is uh, what I call Feynman's maxim, named after Richard Feynman, uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist who was doing safe cracking during the Manhattan Project just for fun. And that basically says the organization's gonna fear and despise loyal people that point out problems more than the actual bad guys. So this is a real problem that vulnerability assessors and ethical hackers face. And then there's the unfortunate show me maxim, which basically says no real uh, improvement's gonna occur until there's widespread recognition and overwhelming evidence that the bad guys have already catastrophically exploited a particular vulnerability. So this is kind of discouraging because uh, you know you can do all this great work, find the vulnerabilities, suggest very practical countermeasures, and until something really awful happens, usually there won't be any improvements. So, but this is really why 
you want to do vulnerability assessments, why you want to do ethical hacking. This is named for the economist Milton Friedman. He wasn't talking about security, but it applies to security. And he says, only in a crisis, actual or perceived, only that will produce real change. When the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around, right? So that's why vulnerability assessors and hackers want to do these things. They want to find vulnerabilities, suggest countermeasures, come up with better security devices, come up with better security strategies. Not because anyone's likely to pay any attention, but because when there is a panic, there'll be better ideas laying around for people to grab. And that's, that's kind of, unfortunately, the goal. So, lots and lots of attack vectors. I'll just sort of rattle off some of them, give you a sense of the kinds of things you can do. You probably fully understand these. A few years ago, I wrote a taxonomy paper, and I pointed out 91 different generic attacks on tags and 105 on seals. I'm sure I missed some. So there's lots of attacks. You can always swap a device out for a counterfeit one at the factory, at the loading dock, in transit, before it's installed, after it's installed. Uh, you can install back doors. You can trivially defeat the mechanical tamper switch or light sensors. These are not serious tamper detection. You can do electronic cyber microprocessor attacks. You can freeze or depower the microprocessor so it goes to sleep. You can tamper with the sensors, copy the database, the authorized user data or the keys. You can de do meekening, which is replaying a valid signal. You can do cosmetic or full repairs. Man in the middle attacks, very, very effective. So that's where you sit at some communications channel, either internally or to the outside world. Sometimes you just listen, sometimes you block the signal, sometimes you inject fake signals. Easy to do. You can counterfeit, but usually you don't have to. Counterfeiting is easier than most people think, in my experience, but usually you just have to mimic. Uh, sometimes you just have to fool a reader, which is really easy. There are lots of examples, for example, of seal readers where the seal has clearly been smashed open, but the reader was happy, so the seal inspector was happy. So there's lots of attacks like that. Uh, you can reuse authentic parts. You can do insider attacks using disloyal insiders. You can attack the training and the user's manuals, so they use the, the security products incorrectly. Uh, you can do timers, remote control. You can exploit test points and calibration procedures, which engineers often fail to turn off once the unit goes out for sale. You can try saturation of sensors. You can try division by zero. Often the firmware people haven't thought about that. And you can do time slip attacks where you change the time. Those can be very, very effective. So lots of different approaches. Where do you get equipment, ideas, supplies, expertise, support? I'm not sure why ethical hackers don't do more crowdsourcing to find vulnerabilities. Um, I always found you could get an enormous amount of help for free from artists and art supply stores, model railroaders, scale hobbyists have wonderful tools and supplies. They make counterfeits. They shrink the scale, but they can make counterfeit people and counterfeit trees. Amazing stuff. Antique and auto body repair people, unbelievable skills. Wonderful stuff you can use. Um, and um, old time machinists, not the guys that program CNC machines, but the old guys who actually one or two parts on an actual mechanical lathe or end mill. Of course, you can always go to patents because by law they have to be fully enabling. If you're not big on electronics or microprocessors, I really suggest you get the Arduino, kind of a hobbyist microprocessor system, very cheap, wonderful online community to help you out. I've had students with no electronics experience, very little computer programming experience. Within half a day, they're doing fairly sophisticated projects on the Arduino. You can demonstrate attacks that way, and then if you need to shrink the size down, you can move over to the PIC microprocessors, which are very, very cheap, and you can get surface mounts, so they're super tiny, and you can hide them inside circuits and that kind of thing. I think hackers should take a look at time-expiring visitor badges. Corporations love these. They think they're high security. What you do is you bend, you fold over this tab, and then a red die diffuses through in 24 hours to make the void sign. So the badge has expired. So there's at least 10 ways to defeat these things that are very, very easy. This is great because you can get free samples, but even if you buy them, they're pretty cheap. Uh, of course, concert wristbands. Those are you know, fun to play with, easy to defeat. Usually there's not enough light at the concert or wherever you are, the nightclub, to inspect them enough to tell they've been tampered with. Of course, you can counterfeit them too. Anti-counterfeiting tags. Again, largely an unsolved problem, lots of snake oil out there. 
Anybody tells you that holograms, encryption, fluorescent dyes, and fixed serial number RFIDs are the solution to anti-counterfeiting tags. Uh, they either haven't thought the problem through or they're misleading you. Counterfeiting these things is pretty easy, but it's overkill. You just have to mimic them. Sometimes just fooling the reader. And again, the reader is often easy to tamper with. It's not typically secured very well, so you can always go after the reader. And you can spoof it at a distance if it reads radio frequency or optical information. You know, beyond uh, spotting fake products, there's also you know, going beyond tags to more effective ways, such as analyzing the product. And this is where hobbyist hackers, I think, could really help out. Um, so the anti-counterfeiting tags we have don't really work very well. Um, but the product counterfeiting is a big problem. So experts disagree a little bit, but most agree that about 3.3% of all international trade is in fake or counterfeit products. This represents two trillion US dollars a year in fake goods. In some developing countries, 10 to 30% of the pharmaceuticals are fake. And this may cause between 100,000 and 1 million deaths per year from fake pharmaceuticals. So you can do a real public service if you can look into issues of how do you spot fake products, educate people, uh, point out some of the problems, shame some of the legitimate manufacturers into doing a better job with being able to authenticate their products, make kits, and, and just in general get the public more aware of the problem. This is a role I think hackers can play. With SEAL, SEALs are always fun to work with, um, but I always found SEAL testing very tricky. So invariably, the only practical way wasn't to test it in the field. There's all kinds of logistical problems with that. So we would bring in someone to the laboratory. Invariably, they'd send their best SEAL inspector. The SEAL inspector's been alerted the SEAL's been tampered with, so they're paying a lot more attention. Uh, we'd fool them anyway, but still, it's very tricky. And invariably, the SEAL inspector would say, well, all the SEALs have been defeated because they don't want to be embarrassed and miss one. So then we'd have to set up quotas. Well, out of these 12 SEALs, you can only pick up to five that you think have been tampered with. And you really can't look at them side by side because that's not how it works in the field. You get one SEAL, make a decision. Um, you know, we'd still beat them anyway, but it, it, it's very, testing SEALs and SEAL attacks is a very tricky business for a lot of different reasons. Locks, are, I think, are a lot easier. Of course, uh, ethical hackers, even hobbyists, can go after biometrics, access control devices, voting machines, overall election security. I think, in, in my view, every citizen ought to be questioning the security of their elections. It's not just about technology. It's just about the processes. Uh, the security is typically very, very weak. So in general, hobbyist hackers in particular, don't just demonstrate attacks, devise practical countermeasures. It doesn't matter if you find the ultimate countermeasure just think of some, and that will get people going. Uh, I found many times my practical countermeasures I thought were good have various reasons why they weren't, but it got the end user thinking about it. You want to develop as a hacker better security strategies, better metrics, better prototype security devices. Again, reason is for the Friedman Max, and the idea is that we need better ideas, better technology lying around. And hobbyists can actually play a role in this. Amateurs can indeed contribute. So if you'd like more information, particularly copies of the maxims or papers and talks about some of the topics I've talked about, that's available on our webpage. Uh, also, I, I encourage you, if you uh, do something interesting, uh, maybe submit a paper to the Journal of Physical Security. This is a free online nonprofit peer-reviewed journal. Uh, also, you can sign up for email notifications when new issues come out. Anyway, I'd be certainly be glad to answer questions. I will be here for the next couple days and certainly be glad to chat with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. Um, Roger's also going to take a few questions now if anyone has anything. All right, I guess we're good. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting.